sort of a last hurrah before the end, spring break. We'll be back afterwards uh, with the sort of liter uh, literary portion of the, uh, more literature oriented portion of the semester uh, afterwards. We'll finish up with uh, a talk on uh, James Joyce and post 9-11 literature. Uh, the last illuminations will be the 17th of April. And when is Agata's talk? Third. The 3rd of April, okay, so after we get back from break. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to have a good friend of mine here from Philadelphia. Uh, Gabrielle and I got our master's degree together at uh, Westchester University and studied philosophical practice uh, together with um, Lou Marinoff and Oscar Renfier. Uh, so a lot of what she's going to be talking about, um, I'm really glad she was able to make it. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Gabrielle. Of course, certified philosophical practitioner by the American Philosophical Practitioners Association. Um, she's done summer seminars with the French Institute of Philosophical Practice, um, the uh, Utrecht uh, University Summer Program on uh, Museum Ethics, uh, participant in the American Association of Philosophy Teachers Graduate Teaching Seminar, International Summer Program, Philosophy in Schools, Oslo University College, um, as well as uh, her two most uh, recent publications, uh, first with Morton Fassbold, uh, How Dewey's View on Aesthetics is Relevant to Philosophical Counseling in uh, the Journal Philosophical Practice, and The Need for Husserl's uh, Rational Inner Subjectivity to Prevent Further Adverse Effects of Science and Technology on Life and Ethics. Um, so without further ado, it's my uh, very, very great pleasure to introduce Ms. Uh, Gabriela Ruda. indeed for that warm welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, and have uh, made it. It was I missed a train, late plane from Philadelphia to Chicago, had to rent a car. Um, so uh, I'm glad that I had to put in some effort to be here. It makes it all the more rewarding to be in front of you today. Uh, so Donovan, when Donovan first uh, approached me about coming out here, it was from the perspective, uh, or he wanted me to address some ideas about um, philosophy outside of the academy. And uh, I think I have quite a bit of experience uh, with that in the last decade. Um, so I have, uh, but and there's a lot uh, of, that happens outside of the academy that I think people aren't necessarily aware of. Um, so. There's a few different topics that I'd like to address. Um, some I won't get to do uh, full justice to, um, but there are some uh, names of people I'd like to introduce you to that you may not know, and some opportunities to study uh, both in America and abroad um, that you may not be aware of um, that I'd like to introduce you to. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to discuss um, different approaches of philosophical counseling. And, uh, and then later uh, I'll read uh, this paper that Morton Fostwald and I wrote on um, using Dewey's philosophy for philosophical counseling, which uh, we believe is an original idea and tries to change up um, the methods uh, for doing philosophical practice. And then I have uh, a video of myself and the French philosopher Oscar Renefier, um, uh, where I'm the client undergoing philosophical counseling. Um, and uh, I will show you some uh, excerpts from that. So, um, yeah, examples of applied philosophical practice. The first thing I want to mention is that, um, and, and in terms of who I am and what I do in the world of philosophy, I, I like to think of myself as a philosopher for, ch philosopher for children. And um, how I went about becoming one is after, well, during the course of my bachelor's degree in philosophy at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, uh, I, which was the result of um, the, the death of uh, my best friend um, who was killed in Iraq uh, when uh, he was 20 years old, I was still 19, and uh, I needed some consolation and some uh, ability uh, to, some tools to cope with this experience in life that I had been thrown into. And philosophy, uh, which was a required uh, you know, course to take at St. Joe's, you had to take three philosophy classes, um, suddenly became much more significant. Uh, made it a little easier to get to class at 8.30 in the morning when I was dealing with this, this trauma. And I threw myself into Plato and Aristotle and, uh, and the existential philosophers and it, it really provided me um, a way uh, to move beyond that experience. And then I thought, 
well, geez, why don't we teach this to children? Wouldn't it be great if we taught this to kids? And uh, as a very naive um, you know, person in my late teens, early 20s, I thought that I must have been the first person to think of that idea. Uh, but it turns out that in the 1970s, a man named Matthew Lippman, who was a professor of philosophy at Columbia University, got that idea. Um, has anyone ever heard of Matthew Lippman? <laughs> Not, I guess I would think of the students. You guys know Matt Lippman? Yeah? Okay, great. So um, Matthew Lippman started the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children in the 70s. And um, unfortunately, they, um, the, the doctoral uh, degree is, is no longer in existence um, unless you are tenured into the program and trying to finish your dissertation. Um, they lost funding from Montclair uh, so that it's no longer a doctoral program. Um, they're trying to get uh, you know, students into the masters, there's no funding. So philosophy for children has never particularly taken off in the US. They still run two summer training programs each year, which I highly recommend. I did those. The first is where you learn to become a facilitator of philosophical dialogue for children and how to facilitate a community of inquiry. Uh, and that is the way I best like to teach both my college classes and with kids sitting them in a circle, um, reading text out loud, um, either uh, it's, it's difficult to try to get a group of college students to read Kant out loud together, um, but I think it has value. So you have to do a very close reading of the text ahead of time to choose something with great meat, um, because otherwise, uh, since it is based on democratic process, um, the group can choose to focus on a theme or a question that is not quite relevant to what you had planned to question them on the midterm about. Um, but it was one of the most significant experiences of my life, uh, going and uh, living for a week with philosophers from around the world and training to become a facilitator um, of philosophy for children. After that, um, the next level of the program is uh, another week-long residential seminar where you learn to develop curriculum uh, for children and uh, become uh, more um, conversant with Matt Littman's text and the teacher's manuals to use. Um, from there, I uh, wanted to continue to learn about philosophy for children and how it was utilized and different approaches to it around the world. Uh, that led me to Oslo, Norway, where there are two professors, uh, a Norwegian woman named Beata Borsen and a Swedish man named Bo Malmhester, who teach a course each summer um, when there's uh, a lot of um, uh, funds available to, to go there and, and live there uh, for free during the course of the summer. Um, so I highly recommend pursuing that at the Oslo University of College. And there you learn the Norwegian approach to philosophy for children. Um, they start doing philosophy with kids um, in kindergarten uh, in Norway. And kindergarten is not the year-long program that we have here. Kindergarten is um, daycare for them. Um, mothers have about a year maternity leave. Fathers have three months. Uh, and then after that, um, the kids go into what is kindergarten and are there until uh, first grade. Uh, for us, and they use the Socratic method and dialectic with children at all levels of engagement, even pre-linguistic skills. They're questioning children about, um, you know, uh, food behaviors and uh, clothing changing and uh, all, all sorts of things along those lines. The, the most important aspect of uh, studying philosophy for children in Norway is an emphasis on pedagogical documentation, which I think um, is lacking in philosophy for children in the U.S. There's a heavy emphasis on journal writing or log book writing, as they call it. And uh, it's quite important because part of the reason why philosophy for children has not, I think, taken off the way it could have in the U.S. is that there is not enough um, qualitative and quantitative research at the end of the day to show people um, the benefits of what philosophy for children um, can help them achieve uh, later on in life and how it shapes children's brains. Um, so when I was in uh, Norway, I was uh, exposed to the pedagogy of a French philosopher named Oscar Brenefier, uh, who has become a significant mentor in my life, and, and he's the, the guy in the video. I will show later. Um, Oscar is a very controversial figure around the world. Uh, I, would, I would venture to say that he is the most successful um, philosopher for children and uh, philosophical counselor um, out there. Uh, he has um, over 20 books 
uh, that he's written for kids that are published in uh, nearly 20 languages, uh, except his work has never um, been published in English uh, because he writes um, not just about um, the positive aspects of life for children, but he also presents ideas on coping with anxiety and death and fear and loss for children, and American publishers are not particularly interested in exposing kids to that, unfortunately. So uh, learning about Oscar was quite significant. Uh, and from there, I, I learned that he does um, annual summer residential training programs in learning to be a philosophical counselor. So I went to study with Oscar in France on a number of occasions. I also then, it led me to going to Iceland and studying with Oscar in Iceland and teaching in Iceland, teaching philosophy to kids in Iceland um, and the like. So it was a um, significant foray from philosophy for children for me into philosophical counseling uh, and took me outside of um, the normal path that I think people um, choose in pursuing a career being a philosopher. For example, I, I do not have a PhD and I'm not currently a candidate for a PhD anywhere. Uh, I would like one, not in philosophy though. So um, that has proved to be uh, a bit of a um, roadblock in life, trying to find out hmm, what to do now. Um, but I don't think that a, a PhD in philosophy will, will serve me well for what, I, what I'd like to accomplish. Um, so still up in the air there. So I'd like to, to talk now a bit more about um, philosophical counseling in particular. There are, there are really two kinds of approaches um, to philosophical counseling. Um, one is a method-based approach, another is beyond method. Uh, while many people think that, um, and I guess it certainly is, philosophical counseling is one of the oldest professions uh, that exists because you know we see Socrates doing it, right? We, we don't all get paid for it. Um, but uh, people have been engaging in dialectic with one another um, for centuries. Um, so we've got method and beyond method. Uh, but then philosophical counseling is uh, now currently kind of still in its infancy, really. It, it started in the 70s. It's debatable whether it began. Um, American philosophers will tell you they started it on the West Coast in the 70s. Um, German philosophers will tell you that they started it uh, in the 70s, and the Dutch um, also. Uh, are, are thrown in there as well. One of the most important early figures in philosophical counseling is uh, a German named uh, Gerd Achenbach. That's not his last name, but uh, not you know his actual last name, but this name Achenbach, uh, the Ach, he thought was um, very existential and uh, a way of releasing tension. And uh, so he adopted that as his last name to help uh, with his, uh, his practice. Um, a lot of my knowledge of philosophical counseling comes from my time living in Norway. Um, there uh, you can get a master's degree in philosophical counseling. It is a profession. Um, people make a living being philosophical counselors in Norway. You can work in hospitals. Uh, you can work in prisons. Uh, and it's not a foreign concept that if you have a problem in your personal life, that you would think to Google a philosophical practitioner as opposed to just going to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, so I've had the pleasure of getting to know many of them there. So we got these, the method and beyond method can also be broken down into a conversational style of philosophical counseling or an interrogative style of philosophical counseling. Um, so the conversational style you find um, predominant in Germany and in Norway in the Netherlands, in America also. And you can call the conversational style hermeneutical uh, because it is based on interpretation of a, a narrative that a client or guest is going to provide to a philosopher. Um, so these conversational counselors will practice active listening um, to what the, the client has to say. And the counselor will permit himself or herself to give interpretations um, their own interpretations of what the, the client is, uh, is saying to them. These kinds of counselors have to have great patience, right, which is not something everybody has. Um, and the counselor relies on inspiration, uh, gut feelings, and knowledge of the, the philosophical canon in order to be able to help someone. Uh, then you find that these counselors, uh, they have an ethical demand of seeing a person in an existential manner and showing great respect to them. 
Uh, you're not just looking at the person's problem in isolation, um, i.e. just uh, a problem of thinking that they're exhibiting. You really have to see the person as a person uh, in the context that they're presenting themselves to you. Um, but then you find that there's a problem uh, that emerges with this about method. Um, many people have questioned whether philosophical counseling can be taught, um, if so, in what way, and if it can't be taught, what enables a person to be a philosophical counselor. Um, the program Donovan and I did uh, through the APPA, the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, which is based out of New York City, um, run by Lou Marinoff, uh, who is, I don't know if he's still the head of the department at City College, um, but he was for a long time and is trying to bring uh, a master's program to City College in um, philosophical practice and uh, you know, like um, being uh, learning to be a critic, you can you know become a get a master's and becoming a critic and such like that. Uh, so with Lou, you have to have a, a master's degree um, going into the program, and that um, provides some of the basis for. Uh, liability that you know like that the fact that we have something to say that can help someone some proof of knowledge of philosophy um, so a master's in philosophy is, is the basis studying with Oscar uh, you, you don't need to have a master's degree um, because a lot of what Oscar does and I'll present that a bit later the interrogative style is um, based on, on working on yourself and, and training beyond that um, so there's a lot of scrutiny for philosophical counselors because uh, do we have any value? Are we trained enough? Um, could we do damage? Uh, that is um, you know, part of the problem as to why it's not a viable career option uh, in the United States yet. So um, this example of uh, beyond method, I spoke of earlier, uh, Gerrit Achenbach, um, he fostered that uh, in the 80s in opposition to aspects of professional health care in medicine, psychiatry, and psychology, where patients were turned into objects that needed to be dealt with in certain ways. Um, he thought that that was a significant problem, and so this much more free-form conversational style of addressing the person's problem in a very existential way came about. So we have this debate, do we need a specific method in philosophical counseling or not? Um, and it would seem quite obvious that we do need method and we do need tricks of the trade and we do need a, a toolbox of skills that we can use at our disposal in order to be able to help people and identify um, problems that they uh, come up you know, that, that are presented in the course of a consultation. Uh, so this interrogative style of Oscar Brenefier, um presents a kind of radical otherness, and, and you will see that in the video. Um, Oscar violates guidelines of conversational skills and context sensitivity. Um, after an initial question that you ask Oscar, um, there's no narrative that um, you're allowed to provide. Uh, the discussion is kept purely at a conceptual level and Oscar is able to pinpoint people's problems or propensities um, based on the concepts that you provide. Um, so you'll see that Oscar is a lot like Socrates in many ways, uh, certainly a gadfly. Um, so he's similar to Socrates as this approach, um, similar to Socrates as this approach may be, uh, Oscar differs from Socrates in, in a significant way by relying heavily on, its, uh, on his on it, his style, being a game that the client is asked to play, that the, you know, the client asks to play. You either play along or you don't, and if you don't, the session breaks down. Part of the game is committing yourself to concepts and propositions you come up with as the ball is played in your direction. Figuratively speaking, you are urged to react spontaneously, if not automatically, as you still have to think. This may be labeled as free association technique on a conceptual level, which indeed reveals your propensities, much to your own surprise. Here we may speak of a feature that has more in common with psychoanalysis than with Socrates, even if we are not dealing with psychology as psychologists do. This may be a harsh experience that many people will not be up to, which therefore limits the potential number of clients suitable to such a kind of practice. Um, so Oscar is very aggressive with people, often um, makes people cry, um, and uh, it's
something and um, a, a problem that results from this is um, that people may miss, miss what's happening, significant logical moves, um, because there's such a quick back and forth that happens with Oscar. So in the last several years, what he's taken to do is um, video record the sessions and then have the people analyze the videos afterwards and answer a series of 20 some odd questions about um, the session that you had in order for you to see your own breakdown in logic and um, to be able to own uh, some of these concepts that have come up um, in the consultation. Okay, so we've got the interrogative style and the conversational style. Um, my work with uh, Norwegian philosopher Morten Fosswold um, has been very uh, significant in um, developing uh, my views on, uh, on philosophical counseling. And I'd have you look up Morton Fosvold um, at, at some point, um, F-A-S-T-V-O-L-D. He's got a website. Um, many of his papers are in English. I think he has done an excellent job describing different approaches to philosophical counseling around the world. Mm. So I exposed him um, to... John Dewey's Artist Experience uh, several years ago, which is a seminal work for me. Um, in addition to teaching philosophy to kids and, and, uh, and undergrads at St. Joe's University, I've also been um, a docent and K-12 art educator at the Barnes Foundation in uh, Philadelphia for many years. You guys ever heard of the Barnes Foundation? Largest private collection of art um, in the world. Uh, of a largest private collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist art in the world. We've got 180 Renoirs, uh, 69 Cezannes, 59 Matisses, 46 Picassos, uh, and the like. John Dewey was our director of education for the first 30 years of the Foundation's history, and um, Artist Experience um, was a text that he wrote um, for the curriculum of the Barnes. So, um, I think that what happens is, uh, or what the the aesthetic dimension of life is one of the most important aspects of the human condition, which is often overlooked um, due to the emphasis on ethical dimensions of life, uh, of course, and, and critical thinking. And so, I'd like to, um, you know, uh, deliver this paper now um, that Morton and I wrote on how Dewey's view on aesthetics is relevant to philosophical counseling, because I think it provides a different um, scaffolding of method to bringing uh, the aesthetic component into philosophical practice. Okay, so, I'm going to do that. Right. Uh, while truth, good, and beauty are the three fundamental concepts in philosophy at large, philosophical counselors tend to focus on the truth and the good only, in contrast with the notions of critical inquiry and ethical considerations of what is right and wrong and good and bad. The aesthetical concepts of beauty and ugliness and of what is delightful and repulsive, harmonic and upsetting are considered less important or even irrelevant in a consultation setting. A counselor might, of course, encourage clients to pursue a career as an artist or to attend evening classes on painting or poetry if this might enhance their personal development. But unless an aesthetic point has an obvious bearing on the client's problem, considered to be a rare instance, the common wisdom is that such discussions should be left to the art schools and the evening classes. Such a view of aesthetics fails, however, to grasp what, is, uh, what this domain is really about. It wrongly assumes that aesthetics is something quite superficial and even extravagant, like an icing of the cake, and thus misses out on the significance the aesthetic dimension has in human life. One then misguidedly puts aesthetics on the very top of a Maslowian hierarchy of needs, even above the need of self-realization. And as the usual interpretation of Maslow goes, such a need can be met only after the other, more basic needs of food, shelter, and security, uh, food, shelter, security, and social belonging have been dealt with. To indulge in aesthetic experiences could then be regarded as a luxury, as a topic for specifically interested for the specially interested who have time, money, and surplus energy to cultivate themselves by visiting art galleries or going to the theater or opera house. Uh, this next section, th section of the paper is called Dewey, Not Maslow. If we are to counter the commonsensical and misguided icing of the cake view on aesthetics, we must let go of a Maslowian influence hierarchical thinking. 
The object of this paper is to do just that, and to show that life, or rather human experience, has a profound aesthetic dimension. It is important for philosophical counselors to realize this, and accordingly integrate considerations of an aesthetic kind in their practice. By stating this, we are not advocating any new or revolutionary stance. We have just rediscovered some 80-year-old insights from a well-known philosopher, John Dewey, and interpret them in a way to make them relevant for philosophical counseling. In our view, Dewey's aesthetic and epistemic theories, in fact, provide a conceptual scaffolding for practitioners to organize and interpret the thoughts the client puts forward. In his book, Artist Experience, first published in 1934, after previously given as a series of lectures at Harvard University, Dewey counters right from the start the widespread notion of, quote, a separation from the objects and scenes of a separation of art from the objects and scenes of ordinary experiences. Dewey's uh, intent is to provide a better understanding of what an aesthetic object or performance amounts to. In order to do this, he sets out to do no less than quote restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are the works of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are usually recognized to constitute experience. Dewey assumes two things. One, there is a continuity and not a rupture between the world of fine arts and craft and everyday events. And two, this continuity has to be restored in order to make it clear how significant the aesthetic dimension in fact is in human life. Interestingly enough, Dewey, or interesting to us, Dewey must arrive at the theory by means of a detour. In order to get aesthetics down from the pedestal it misguidedly has been put on, and to reintegrate it into our everyday events, doings, and sufferings, where it just as much belong, and in fact has its origin. It is during this detour, before Dewey deals particularly with art, we realize how his understanding of aesthetics, or rather how an experience can have an aesthetic aspect, and how the, as and how the aesthetic is intimately connected to experience. Um, and this is quite relevant to philosophical counseling. Especially the first four chapters of artist experience are then recommended as well worth reading for philosophical counselors at large. Anyone here read artist experience? Yeah? Okay. I highly recommend it, particularly again the first four chapters. Um, not just for philosophical counselors, but I think that um, for anyone, uh, the, the core of what having an aesthetic experience is and how that influences our lives. Um, is, is quite significant, and it, uh, it's a text that has the capacity to broaden someone's horizons in a very significant way. Um, so we have aesthetic versus an aesthetic, ex an aesthetic experiences. As the title of the book implies, the notion of experience is pivotal in Dewey's discussion. He closely links the concepts of aesthetics and experience by way of making his detour into some very fundamental considerations. According to Dewey, experiences occur whenever a live organism interacts with its environments, which happens continuously in the process of living. As creatures, we struggle with our environments both internally and externally in order to find balance and equilibrium. We often find ourselves, however, in a state of, equilibri uh, a state of disequilibrium, right? Have you ever been in a state of disequilibrium? Right. I sort of feel like I'm in one now. Okay. <laughs> The more of that will be revealed later due to my state of view, why I'm in a state of disequilibrium. Uh, but we're often that way, since we constantly have to interact with environments that challenge us again and again. In order to cope with this hardship of life, our interaction is geared toward a specific end, to achieve a short-lived but nonetheless significant moments of balance and equilibrium, which facilitates growth or self-cultivation. Self As Dewey states, Equilibrium comes about not mechanically and inertly, but out of and because of tension. This is an important point, given that the idea of equilibrium, which Dewey claims is what we all seek, is brought about by the tension stemming from our interaction with our environments. In light of this basic condition for human life, and for other creatures as well, Dewey sets out to show us that our experiences can be grouped into four kinds. The lowest kind of experience that can be had is thus an anesthetic experience, which is when our senses are numbed so that we cannot perceive the aesthetic qualities that exist in particular objects, people, or environments. This is 
basically how a lot of people live at this anesthetic level, right? Many people don't stop to smell the roses or appreciate a sunset. I think probably everybody knows someone in their life who unfortunately exists in that anesthetic that state. Um, the next level up is general experience, which happens all the time. In both of these lower levels, we tend not to appreciate the sounds and rhythms of brushing our teeth every morning or the kind of interplay and dance of cars during rush hour traffic, right? Wouldn't that be great if we could find beauty and value in that? In much of our experience, quote, we are not concerned with the connection of one incident with what went before and what comes after. Things happen, but they are neither definitely included nor definitely excluded. We drift. We yield according to external pressure or evade and compromise. There are beginnings and secessions, but no genuine initiations and concludings. One thing replaces another, but does not absorb it and carry it on. There is experience, but so slack and discursive that, is, that it is not an experience. Needless to say, such experiences are anesthetic. After training our perceptual faculties, we can come to have what Dewey depicts as an experience. This is when an event demarcates itself from other common ordinary experiences. It is when we can give the experience a name. That meal in Rome, that ball game, that plane ride, that sunset in Hawaii. As the pedagogue Philip W. Jackson points out in his book, John Dewey and the Lessons of Art, such an experience has three qualities. Right, so these are, an experience has three qualities. It has a unifying emotion associated with it. It possesses uniqueness, and it is rounded out in such a manner that it can be said to be complete. In Dewey's words, quote, the existence of this unity is constituted by a single quality that pervades the entire experience in spite of the variation of its constituent parts. So the idea of, of a single quality um, that can be used to name an experience is something that you find Oscar Brenefier doing in the interrogative style of philosophical counseling. He wants you to be able to name the kind of experiences that you're having. Um, and it's often hard to, uh, at least I find. So the highest level of experience is an aesthetic experience. In addition to the three qualities of an experience just mentioned, an aesthetic experience occurs when we are appreciative, perceiving, and enjoying what is being undergone. Right? Those are the three components, appreciative, perceiving, and enjoying. It is also important to recognize that experience exists in time and changes over time. It always has a history. An instantaneous experience is an impossibility, biologically and psychologically speaking. Experiences are then a product, one might say, or one might almost say a byproduct of continuous and cumulative interaction of an organic self with the world. The arts provide us with an exemplary instances of an aesthetic experience. The true work of art is not, however, an object that sits in a museum or a performance on a stage or captured on film or disc. Rather, it is the experience occasioned by the production or the experience of appreciating objects or performances. For the artist, these two forms of experiencing are one. Within the field of philosophical counseling, this amounts to identifying clients' experiences. More basically, their engagements with their environment and the people in them, as more or less completed works of art. By obtaining this point of view, the aesthetic qualities of the experience in question will both be relevant and revealing. The next section is about experience is transactional. As Dewey states, an aesthetic experience is always more than aesthetic. Quote, in it a body of matters and meanings, not in themselves aesthetic, become aesthetic as they enter into an ordered rhythmic movement towards consummation. End quote. Then the aesthetic cannot be regarded as a separate entity that can be identified in some pure form in itself. It must instead emerge through an, an, an experience, along with this experience's non-aesthetic features. The wholeness of an experience in terms of its having its own individualizing quality and self-sufficiency, where its various parts are linked to one another 
and do not merely succeed one another is not, strictly speaking, an aesthetic feature. Yet it obtains an aesthetic quality as those parts, through their experienced linkage, move towards a consummation and close, not merely to secession in time. It is also important to note that Dewey asks us to abandon the convention of looking upon experience as something that happens exclusively within us, that is, as an essentially psychological concept. In its place, he would substitute a conception far more inclusive, one that embraces what is being experienced as well as by the experience. Uh, one that is, excuse me, one that embraces what is being experienced as well as the experiencer. Instead of sh uh, signifying being shut up within one's own private feelings and sensations, Experience signifies complete interpenetration of the world and the self with objects uh, and events. Water. Thus, as Jackson states, experience is transactional. It is not just what registers on our consciousness as we make our way through the world, but includes the objects and events that compose that world. These objects and events are much more a part of an experience as we are ourselves. When we are fully immersed in an experience, its components interpenetrate one another so much that we lose all sense of separation of self, object, and event. It is when situations become problematic, when something goes wrong, or when for some other reason we pause to reflect upon the circumstances at hand, that such distinctions become evident. Then we start to isolate this or that element within experience in order to cope better with the situation as a whole. Since the self constantly has to interact with some object outside of itself, an experience must be regarded as a process which, quote, continues until a, mutually, a mutual adaptation of the self and the object emerges, and that particular experience comes to a close. Jackson again. The interaction of these two constitutes the total experience that is had, and the close which completes it is the institution of a felt harmony. This notion of a felt harmony has an unmistakable aesthetic as well as experiential streak. It is important to note that such a felt harmony does not only arise when we contemplate a piece of fine art or read a novel or a poem or watch a play or a ballet. We also get the sensation we ha when we have an experience in real life that turns out well since we then manage to adapt with the environment or manage to cope with the situation in a favorable and even graceful way, to put it in less general terms. When we feel enriched and fulfilled in a profound sense, which is hard to explain, or excuse me, we then feel enriched and fulfilled in a profound sense, which is hard to explain. This is a good indication that the aesthetic dimension of an experience is quite profound, just as Dewey states. Then we have moved as far from the icing of the cake view of aesthetics as we can possibly get. If the constant strife for adaptation rewards us with a felt harmony when the outcome is favorable, it, is also, uh, it also is the case that experiences have an element of undergoing, of suffering in its large sense. If not, there would be no taking in of what preceded. It is, in fact, by way of outer resistance, we become conscious of ourself and get the opportunity to develop. When we speak of a favorable outcome, we must speak of favorable in a wide sense. Favorable should then include instances where a person manages to reconcile with new and dire life prospects. After having been physically impaired by some serious accident or disease, or after having lost someone near and dear, or when economic disaster strikes, or even uh, a collective disaster is when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. The dignity and grace Nelson Mandela radiated in speech and deeds and attitude after decades of imprisonment was just as much of an aesthetic as of an ethical kind. He had obviously coped very well with the dire circumstances which is not just an ethical matter. We are, however, not very well aware of the aesthetical aspect of human, uh, human conduct outside the realm of artful, artful performances, 
and thus tend to overlook it. By contrast, we are very preoccupied with ethics respect for this aspect in everyday life. We mainly become conscious of the aesthetical aspect in a situation when this is highlighted in an artwork. Then we fail to realize that not only art, but also instances of real life can have a significant aesthetic quality. I might be preaching to the choir on this, though. Does everyone have a very rich aesthetic life? That, you know, <laughs> anyone who's got blinders on for the most part? Because um, I, fi I do find that a lot of people are, are lacking um, the, uh, the aesthetic aspect, even when giving tours at the Barnes Foundation and, you know, turning people on to these ideas in a much more distilled manner in the course of uh, having discussions about Renoir and Van Gogh um, and looking closely at paintings, uh, the connection between um, the aesthetic aspects of a work of art and how that is infused into daily life seems to be broken down somewhere. Not for y'all. Probably not. Okay. Um, then we deal with an intricate web of concepts. As the aesthetic is not a distinct feature on its own, uh, but emerges through other features of experience, Dewey has to explore the aesthetic by making a quite intricate web of different concepts. It is not possible to fully account for this web with a brief summary. Um, here we must content ourselves with stating that a linkage of concepts into an organic whole is what the Deweyan approach to the aesthetic amounts to. Unlike a hierarchical view where the different elements do not merge, but are conceived as, a distinct, uh, as distinct layers on top of each other, the idea of an organic whole is, a far more, is far more difficult to grasp. Instead of regarding aesthetics as some separate spices that can be added to life in an external sense, as an herb can be added in a pot to give a dish an extra flavor, we have to realize that the aesthetic is, intricate, uh, is intrinsic to experience and uh, that ha excuse me. We have to realize that the aesthetic is intrinsic to experiences that have an aesthetic quality, while at the same time uh, taking part in turning these experiences into an, orga or an organic whole. Such a dialectical interaction is surely harder to draw on the blackboard than a clear-cut pyramid of human needs. To briefly mention some other core features of Dewey's web of concepts, in order to complete an experience we must also have an intention with our effort to adapt with our environments. This presupposes an understanding of cause and effect in our doings, which implies the basic facts that things have consequences. Only then can we have intentions that are sufficiently clear to us, and only then do we get a, a sense of meaning. Our having intentions with our actions is the very condition for meaning. If there is no such intention, there is just chaos. As Dewey puts it, the action and the consequence must be joined in perception. This relationship is what gives meaning. To grasp it is the objective of all intelligence. Dewey does not, however, employ the word intentionality in his discussion, maybe because of its strong associations with phenomenology, which is quite another matter than Dewey's pragmatism. Instead, uh, instead, he refers, uh, he prefers the far less common word impulsion. While an impulse is specialized and rather particular and can even be an instinctive mechanism to adapt with the environment, an impulsion designates a movement outward and forward of the whole organism to which special impulses are auxiliary. Um, impulsion is also the word used to describe horses' legs moving in and out. Um, and it's the, the catalyst for experience for Dewey. Um, we, ha we become aware of the intent implicit in our impulsion. Blind surge is then changed into purpose. Instinctive tendencies are transformed into contrived undertakings. The attitudes of the self are informed with meaning. The distinction between conscious intent, impulsion, and mere impulse is a useful tool for reflection on present and past doings that can help us make sense of an experience and give it meaning. Uh, and this is certainly the case with philosophical counseling. The impulsion of getting from A to B might not be or often is not achieved in a straightforward way. 
If we are sailing, the direction of the wind often makes this impossible. We must then adjust the sails and steer the boat in a way that gives it a zigzag course, but nevertheless makes us approach point B. The course will in most moments be towards points other than B, but our impulsion is all the same to get to B. Such a clear cut impulsion will, together with skills in sailing, enable us to achieve, the, achieve just that. One must learn not to be afraid of taking a different tact i.e. adjusting the sails to catch the wind again, which is about decision making under changing conditions. To employ this nautical analogy in a philosophical counseling session, the counselor should, set, uh, should help clients to write their ship's course in order to account for rough seas or whatever tension that exists in their transactional relationship with the environment. I like nautical analogies a lot. I'm a tall ship sailor and have spent a lot of time um, sailing around uh, various parts of the world and uh, often don't get to go on the tack that I would like because of the wind. So um, I think that this is, uh, this is like life quite a bit. Um, another useful distinction Dewey makes is between undergoing and doing. While undergoing depicts a seemingly passive attitude like everything happens to me, uh, doing depicts the impulse to deal with the situation. The attitude is then to alter the environments rather than oneself in order to adapt. In both cases, there will be an unbalance which, quote, blurs the perception of relations and leaves the experience partially and uh, leaves the experience partial and distorted, with scant or false meaning. This tends to make the experience anesthetic rather than aesthetic, and no experience has a chance to complete itself because something else is entered upon so speedily. What is called experience becomes so dispersed and miscellaneous as hardly to deserve the name. Resistance is treated as an obstruction to be beaten down, not as an invitation to reflection. An individual comes to seek unconsciously even more than by deliberate choice the situations in which he can do the most things in the shortest time. A reconstruction of thought based on new experiences is difficult and causes us to resist. <coughs> the challenge is then to unite the relation between doing and undergoing, which can also be viewed as out, uh, outgoing and incoming energy. This is what turns an experience uh, this is what turns experience into an experience. As Dewey states, the doing may be energetic and the undergoing may be acute and intense, but unless they are related to one another to form a whole perception, the thing done is not fully aesthetic. So this idea of reconstruction of thought based on experience, I think, is one of the key concepts in Dewey's philosophy and is an important tool in philosophical counseling. Um, and I would think also in psychiatry and psychology, people who are dealing with long-held uh, problems uh, and are unable to get themselves out of that or see a new way of engaging and being in the world and to use uh, these aesthetic um, tools that Dewey is providing us uh, can within a philosophical counseling session or series of sessions help somebody, you know, come to view their narrative in a different way um, or a more favorable way because they've been able to work through uh, their problems. Um, so next session uh, section is called "What Emotions and Aesthetics Have in Common." As intentions and resistance are closely linked together, so are intentions and emotions. We have earlier touched upon Dewey's notion of a felt harmony, which arises when we manage to cope favorably with a situation. In addition to its aesthetical streak, this notion has an emotional connotation that is just as obvious. The frustrations and sufferings that spr spring from the resistance of our environments give us, and the tension that our interaction with these environments produces, surely cause an emotional response. Here it must be noted that emotions are not, according to Dewey, simple and compact entities that can be labeled joy, sorrow, hope, 
fear, anger, etc., as is commonly believed. Nor are they mere eruptions and outbreaks, as in small children, or automatic reflexes like fright and shamed modesty. Dewey even says that what is sometimes called an act of self-expression might better be termed one of self-exposure. It discloses character or a lack of character to others. In itself, it is only a spewing forth. By contrast, an artist takes the indirect road of expression instead of the road of discharge. Such an indirect road implies an element of reflection and deliberation that makes us conceive of emotions as qualities of a complete experience that moves and changes. Emotions are thus not to be regarded as something extrinsic to an experience. This is a feature, uh, this is a feature emotions and aesthetics has in common. When an experience is emotional, there are no separate things called emotions in it. Instead, the perceived object or issue is emotionally pervaded throughout. When an aroused emotion does not permeate the material that is perceived or thought of, it is rather preliminary or pathological. If a work of art or an artistic performance is not emotionally pervaded throughout, it is merely craftsmanship, but not art. The same goes with human experiences, as when we are welcomed by a host who expertly uh, executes the rules of politeness but nevertheless leaves us feeling cold and uncomfortable. Then we do not feel welcome at all, since the host's courtesy is not permeated by an emotion of joy or satisfaction that is called for in order to make us really feel at home or welcome. This also goes with stories we are told, both in private life and as counselors. When someone, for instance, tells us about an experience that sticks out to her, we accept aesthetically any amount of moral content if it is held together by a sincere emotion that controls the material. A white flame of pity or indignation may find material that feeds it, and it may fuse together everything, or may, and it may fuse everything assembled into a vital whole. When we might say it feels right, then we might say it feels right. We are, on the other hand, uh, repulsed by a morality imposed on us or on others in an external sense as when someone tries to manipulate us into having a specific emotion. A beggar who gives us a deliberately sad and pitiful glance, or a movie maker who constructs a scene which shall make us cry, are two examples. These are Morton's and I, not, not Dewey's. Dewey might primarily have a novel or stage play in mind when writing uh, these, when you know, discussing these above statements. But these considerations are equally relevant to stories told to us by people we encounter. In a philosophical consultation, the counselor would be better uh, would better be sensitive uh, would better be sensitive to quote the unique and unduplicated character of experienced events and situations, which impregnates the emotion that is evoked. Okay, we're getting there. Almost done. I hate reading papers out loud. Quite a bit. Okay, three pages, can we power through this? I appreciate it. Um, how am I doing on time? What is that, we have an hour up already? Yeah, but we started a little late. Started a little late? Yeah. Um, okay. All right, I'm gonna keep going, can you handle this? Reading papers is awful and I apologize for it, um, but I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, aesthetic uh, of authenticity. Dewey's notion of aesthetic versus anesthetic experiences seem to converge with the dichotomy of authentic versus inauthentic experiences, which philosophical counselors are far more familiar with. Uh, we will in this paper not divulge in, indulge in a discussion of what the difference between these two dichotomies might be, but content, uh, content ourselves to the point of how Dewey's notion can shed some extra light on what an authentic experience amounts to. To take example of Dewey, uh, Dewey as a starting point, uh, quote, if a person puts his room to rights as a matter of routine, he is anesthetic. But if his original emotion of impatient irritation has been ordered and tranquilized by what he has done, the orderly room reflects back to him the change he has taken place, uh, the change that has taken place in himself. He feels not that he has accomplished a needed chore, but has done something emotionally fulfilling. 
His emotion is thus objectified. Uh, his emotion as thus objectified is aesthetic. In philosophical counts, in a philosophical counseling session, an awareness of an aesthetical anesthetic aesthetical versus anesthetical aspect of the two situations sketched might enhance the counselor's ability to reflect with the client on related examples. What is the difference between tidying one's room as a mere dull routine and making such a chore emotionally fulfilling? How can we deal constructively with a troublesome emotion like irritation? How can we object objectify emotions by performing specific deeds? Pondering on such questions might help the client to make sense of her experiences, both past and present, and to deal with future chores in a more meaningful way. Dewey also touches upon the quite frequent tendency people have to jump from one impulse to the next without bothering to finish what they have just started. This goes equally well for thoughts as for deeds, when they deprive themselves of the chance to make sense of an experience, which has to stick out as a complete, as a whole, and not just as a fragment of what might have been an experience in full. As Dewey states, quote, the enemies of the aesthetic are neither the practical nor the intellectual. They are the humdrum, the slackness of loose ends, submission to convention and practice, and intellectual procedure. Rigid abstinence, coerce, coerced submission, tightness on one side of dispassion, incoherence and aimless indulgence on the other, are deviations in opposite directions from the unity of an experience. An instance of such humdrum, slackness of loose ends, and aimless indulgence is the tendency many people have to lose concentration after a short while. Like maybe you're experiencing, or I'm also <laughs> experiencing reading this paper. Long before a task or a line of thought is completed. This urge to jump from impulse to impulse, from digression to digression, might be called the Peter Pan impulse. This is a concept in Morton Fosswell's work. Um, as, it, as it corresponds to Peter Pan's frantic way, uh, ways of giving in to any distraction instead of dwelling with a task or thinking anything through. Then one moves away from creating the unity of an experience, which is what makes such an urge, uh, which makes such an urge the enemy of the aesthetic. We could also say that this urge prevents us an experience from being, uh, which prevents an experience from being authentic. Okay, so um, I'm going to be Peter Pan for a second uh, in an effort to be a bit more authentic and discuss what I uh, particularly um, wanted to talk about today, um, but then thought I shouldn't do instead, um, and also has to deal with the kind of disparate tone of my remarks and. Um, thought to uh, read this paper instead, uh, and will also usher us into um, the, a few clips of Oscar Brenner and I, um, So, because uh, I think it has great value. Um, a month ago, uh, a month and a few days ago, my partner of the last year and a half um, killed himself, and uh, that's awful, and I have um, struggled significantly dealing with that. Uh, and um, continue to do so. Uh, I'm a philosophical counselor, and uh, my love of philosophy has given me a lot of ability to cope with the situation. Um, the morning, at the, the, I, as soon as I found out, um, I didn't find him, thank God. I hadn't heard from him in 24 hours, and I had um, friends go and look for him, and, and so a neighbor found him man also a philosophy professor, as it turns out. Um, anyway, so my mother immediately called a psychiatrist, and the next day I was in, um, uh, in a psychiatrist's office for grief counseling. Uh, I went three times over the course of a week, spent $1,000 on um, psychiatry sessions. Uh, I refused to take any pharmaceuticals. Uh, I also you know, have quit drinking. I haven't wanted to alter my brain chemistry in any way. Um, because I wanted to experience what I was going to go through and not, uh, not hide from it. Psychiatry offered me no help. Um, it was incredibly non-directive, you know, uh, you know the, the guy thought I should join a suicide survivor group and um, offered me a couple books to read, um, which I didn't particularly find helpful. If you ever find yourself in um, um, an experience of, of major bereavement and a loss, 
I would suggest turning to um, C.S. Lewis. His book, um, A Grief Observed, helped me quite significantly uh, contextualize what I was going through. Mm. Time I've had any uh, exposure to suicide, you know, and uh, that had, um, you know, a, a level of darkness that I never expected to deal with um, has been pushed into my life. Uh, so I was able to get a hold of Oscar Renefier, um, my mentor, who I've studied with quite a bit, and, um, and deal with uh, him, ask him for help. Um, and so I had to ask him a question. Um, I, though, I mentioned earlier that when you're dealing with an interrogative style of philosophical counseling, you have to play a game. And um, so it's a, it's a logical uh, exercise game that you play with Oscar. This was this video was shot um, the morning after his funeral, um, and uh, so one one week and a day after finding out that he had died. And I'm not up for playing the game with him. I sort of we got a time difference. He's in Moscow traveling for business. I'm sitting in my bed in my you know childhood home, and uh, it's very early for me, um, and. Uh, I, I, I was confused for a second and thinking, you know, Oscar and I having known each other for so many years and um, that he might have been a friend for a moment to me, but that, that did not happen. We were definitely, we were definitely playing a game. Um, but I had a series of questions that I wanted to ask him to then choose which question we should discuss, uh, and he wasn't going to go along for that. Um, so what the session ends up being about is, um, and all he was able, was willing to let me get out was, how does one overcome a feeling of unwarranted guilt, right? So your lover kills themselves, you feel guilty, right? Um, and so, uh, but I think it's unwarranted, right? Uh, this was not anything I did. Um, the man has three children. It has no bearing on that. Um, you know, he was uh, experienced a, a history of, of clinical depression and, and previous suicide attempts, um, and uh, his best friend of most of his life um, was suing him. They were business partners. And uh, he killed himself two days before a preliminary hearing of uh, a court trial on um, felony theft uh, charges, which I don't think he did. Uh, I don't know. We never went, we never got to court. So, but, you know, those, these is stark reality, right? So anyway, what I also wanted to ask him and to give a sense of what someone experiences when they're, um, you know, going through this is, is, you know, how does one overcome a feeling of unwarranted guilt uh, along with a sometimes warranted feeling of anger, right? I feel angry at this man for taking his life and not um, manning up to, to deal with this. Uh, and I understood that what, what had happened was irrevocable. Um, and I've been working on acceptance, but I don't think acceptance is enough at the end of the day to deal with this. Um, and I wanted to ask him, and I questioned for myself if, um, for, you know, for my own healing and self-preservation and the growth of my heart as I move forward, you know, ought I learn to have to respect the choice that he made? And there's the aspect the kind of bifurcation there. Am I, am I respecting the choice of suicide, and is that possible, or am I respecting the man's autonomy uh, to check out, right? Um, two different issues there that I'm still struggling with. So here is a French man sitting in a hotel room in Moscow. Uh, unwilling. He, I sent him an email, so he knew what had happened, but he wanted no narrative. Um, beyond that. So I'm going to skip to a few things, um, but we get a little bit at the very beginning. Oh, I had to hit that button, didn't I, Donovan? Yeah, the PC um, one, I think. Yeah, there okay, you go. So shift in tone real quick. How are we doing? You all <laughs> seem much more interested, right? Okay, not all of you, but several of you seem more interested. Um, sorry, I'm the, the large screen Oscar filmed this and sent it to me. Um, okay. So, so, the first thing, you know, you take it easy, 
you stop the usual chaos, you know, yeah. just slow down. This is Zen session, you know. Okay. <laughs> I'm working on the I'm working on the on the Zen book right now. It's the, you know this violent teacher thing to get the students to slow down, you know, and stop. Okay. Uh, I read what you sent me. Now uh -huh. what I would like to do is just give me a question that you want to discuss. Just a question. I have um, three questions in four yes. sentences. I, I, you... I'm sure you have more than, than, than I asked you for. Yeah. Is that surprising that you have more than needed? Or it's not, not surprising? No. no. You're still in the superfluous. Well, yes, but I yeah, think that there are many. Don't, don't that, uh, <laughs> yes, and I'm sure you can explain to me for hours why you're in the superfluous, or why it's not called superfluous, right? You would like to explain that to me? No. No, okay, then we're good. So, just give me one question. Okay. How does one overcome a feeling of unwarranted guilt along okay, with the that, sum? That, that, that's plenty. That's plenty, you know? Okay, let me write that. Okay. How does one, yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, tell me, how does one what? I forgot the verb. Overcome. Overcome. A feeling. A feeling of, of unwanted un guilt. Unwarranted. Unwarranted. Yeah. All right, hold on. Let me write. Show me the time. Oh, it should um, at the very end of the bar, maybe? How does one overcome the oh, that's going to show you the thing from the uh, how long it has to go. Guilt, right? Is that good for you or no? Just tell me yes or no. Yes. All right. Huh? But you wanted to add more, of course. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, did you, have you thought why you like the more? Uh, or it's still strange to you? No, I, I no. have thought about why I asked no. more or want more. And you don't know? I do know. Okay, just tell me one explanation why you like the more. Because life is mysterious. Because life is mysterious. Life is mysterious. Now, let me check how much your, your mind is awake. Uh, to the question, why do you want more? The person tells you life is mysterious. Do you think the answer is logical or no? No. 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 Okay. Let's try a logical answer. Why do you want more? Because I have many questions. You have many questions. But you notice, like in this case, I ask you one question, you want to give me three questions plus four sentences, you notice that? Yes. Yes. So, how do you explain that this more stops you from playing the game of which you know the rule? I don't think it stopped the game. Okay, yeah, but you realize... Inconvenient. Well, ah, that sounds kind of fun. Inconvenient. Inconvenient. For whom? Great. But ask your hypothesis, and your answer is, I'm not sure. Does that make sense? No. No. So you see, it's a few times. It's now uh, seven minutes, more or less, we have started. And you say things which are off logically. Correct. You know this. Yes. Does that surprise you? No. No. That's your functioning? Yes. Yes. And how would you qualify that functioning? Um, inconvenient. Inconvenient. For whom? For you or for others? Or for both? Both. For both. And why do you do it? If you, it comes naturally. It comes naturally. So, so the nature of Gabrielle is to be inconvenient. Wow, that sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, if someone again wanted to criticize that functioning, what adjective could he give to it? <coughs> well, you don't know. You have no idea. I can't come up with something immediately. All right. Well, let me propose to you an adjective. It's complacent. Okay. Does that make sense to you that somebody could say, this girl is complacent? Yes. Yes. Uh, she listens to herself. Yes. So, and this complacency, are you familiar with it? Yeah, I am. Yeah. And you know the word. I'm familiar. Uh, well, why did you propose that word? Um... What do you think so far of his style? I like him. Yeah, I know you like him. <laughs> um, he uses, so, you know, there's, there's a method here. In the beginning of a session, you're going to ask someone, you know, test someone to see how clear their mind is, if they're willing to engage in the game or not. Um, so there are teachable moments when he does training programs. Um, but you know, he, I, I wasn't able to come up with the term complacent, um, and my logic is not sharp at all, having just experienced an acute tragedy in my life. And uh, you know, so he will offer concepts to people, um, even though he prefers not to. Also, the man's known me for several years. Um, so I'd like to show you a little more how we should be done soon. Yeah, maybe we should uh, think about t wrapping up for a little break and then maybe Q&A. Okay. Um, let me, I'll just uh, show one more ses one more clip so you get more of a sense Ooh. of who he is. Right? Yes. Does this make sense? It does. All right. So, now suppose you don't work. Let's go with this hypothesis. Why not? Uh, if I don't work on it out of laziness or fear? Well, that, that goes, if you say laziness, it's sort of redundant, right? I'm complacent because I'm lazy, it's redundant, you agree? Yeah, yeah. Fear, that's, that's more of an explanation, right? Now, are, are you familiar with this fear? Yes. Yes? It's fear of what? Um, fear of, uh... Not being good enough? Okay. Of uh, being shitty. Being shitty? Yeah, yes. that's the like term. Yeah. Well, I, I don't like negative words, you know. I am not that. Well, if you're not that, what are you? You know what I mean? <laughs> right? If you're not good enough, is it? <laughs> being shitty. Uh huh. I know I'm an American now with you, and this is not good. You're not like, you're supposed to be positive and not say, but for, you know, for. Uh, uh, rude people who are not too smart, it means being shitty, right? The, the French. <laughs> well, if you want, the, for the no, French. No, I think you accurately represent everyone. Well, yeah. you know, does it make sense that it's, you know, it's feeling like shit, feeling shitty, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, but <laughs> you like to call a cat a cat? Or not too much? I not call a cat a cat. Yeah, but you see, you know, no, I mean, no, you're not so hard about it, <laughs> right? And that's part of being complacent. We try to make things look more palatable, right? Uh -huh. Yes, no? Yes. And you're good at that, making things more palatable. Yeah, lots of words. Yeah, but you know how after you pay the price for that. Yeah. And what's the price you pay for that? That's painful. Um, uh, Self-imposed shame. Okay. So it's, it's, it's shape, yeah? All right. Um, I have a question for you. Unwarranted, uh, I have a doubt. Okay. Means so that you cannot... This goes on for a very long time, of course. Um, I wanted to... Uh, there's a lot more to show, but this obviously hasn't gone as I intended it to because I, I think I was... Uh, as Donovan can attest, you know, I've been um, very concerned about whether or not I would be able to talk t about this in a philosophical way. You know, I've been like deeply upset about what has just happened in my life and I think I sort of inadvertently missed an opportunity because obviously now I'm here in front of you and have exposed this vulnerability that's happening in my life and 
uh, not sobbing as um, <laughs> I have for the for the most part over the last few weeks. Um, but I'm glad that I was able to uh, expose you guys to to Oscar right um, briefly. It, it he's an amazing person to work with. Um, you can contact him via Skype. Uh, and, and do free philosophical counseling with him. Also, there's a large network um, where we practice with one another so you can get paired up with someone anywhere in the world and um, engage in philosophical counseling training. Uh, and also, if you can get yourself to France, um, Oscar provides you know, free tuition to his week-long residential seminars uh, in France every summer. Um, he also now does it in the winter. Um, so there are, there is life outside of academe for philosophers, and if we venture into this territory, um, it can perhaps there there could be a profession and a living in it more readily, uh, and and not just um, you know engage in teaching and close readings of texts and things. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to talk to you. I'm sorry for the interlude with the paper, although I'm not sorry to have introduced um, concepts uh, or the ideas of using uh, Dewey's art as experience um, for philosophical counseling purposes because I think that that um, has great value in it and is something I want to um, you know, pursue as, as a, third, uh, a, a third option for philosophical counseling method. Um, as I go forward and continue to hash out um, these ideas and, and build some more work uh, around these concepts. Um, so thank you for your patience and your attention. Um. <laughs> That's true. Hi, what's your name? Patrick. Patrick, nice to meet you. I'm nice Gabby. To meet you. Uh, sorry for your loss, first of all. Thank uh, you. Second, thanks for, for coming here. Long distance to talk to us about a really intriguing uh, subject and you know, potential for all of us coming out of the program and thinking about what to do in or out of academia. And my second question kind of has to do with that. Uh, but the first one, just briefly, have you attempted to assimilate, or you or any other philosophical practitioners, have attempted to assimilate the work of Viktor Frankl? I personally don't know. Um, Frankl is not a figure that I've spent a considerable amount of time thinking about. Um, so what, what motivates that question? Well, just his uh, existential logotherapy. Mm. And in his works, he talks about uh, practicing uh, sort of dialogue in a Socratic type of way um, with regard to existentialist literature. And so I was wondering about that. And if any of the practitioners that you know of I'm not aware of any myself. No. I would think that, you know, perhaps in Germany, that since it's a much more viable career option there, um, that they might have utilized, you know, that work. Sure. Uh, and then the second question was, does it have to be set up in a one-to-one, -one, just two people in dialogue, uh, for it to be effective, or has there been experimentation with, like, group work? And I'm wondering about that because, uh, so, if we're in a classroom setting, can a professor or a teacher be able to fa facilitate a kind of like therapeutic uh, context or atmosphere um, with, of course, more than one person? And I don't know the method well enough to know how that would be able to be feasible, uh, but do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, group work definitely happens, and uh, I would... I mean, they're kind of in the territory of combining the, the community of inquiry from, um, from philosophy for children uh, with um, philosophical uh, counseling practices. And depending on what aim, you know, I, I don't know what the, what the motivation would be um, in that case, but I, I would certainly think that you could pull that off. Um, there's a lot of room for experimentation. Um, and you know, Oscar does these group training programs all the time. So, um, developing different methods and, and sharpening you know your your tools uh, for engaging this kind of work is uh, very practical in in you know group settings as well. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, also, there's um, a nonprofit that I worked for uh, this past summer 
they're called Build a Bridge International, and they uh, they teach hope, healing, and resilience through music, movement, and dance to homeless children, orphans, and refugees. So they're like ridiculously legit and uh, do a lot of great work around the world. They're based out of Philadelphia. Uh, and they put a lot of emphasis on um, creating safe spaces and, uh, and ritualizing um, activity and uh, you know, creating, the, specifying a threshold uh, in, in pedagogy and, uh, and engagement with the arts. Um, so I think combining you know, all these different endeavors to um, further enhance you know, group philosophical counseling is possible. Also, Build a Bridge has a, um, uh, an annual institute um, every summer uh, where they, you can learn their methodologies and their pedagogical practices, um, and people come from all over the world. Um, so that's another um, opportunity for training. Thanks, Pastor. Yeah? Um, is, are there specific like, genres of art, or artists in particular, say that uh, you take, or anyone in the field takes to have particular therapeutic value? I ask for this because, like, for Hegel, say, like the specific virtue of um, like Dutch genre painting, for example, is that um, its subjects express like <coughs> physiognomies of like freedom and joy in utterly ordinary, what you would call, say, vulgar um, contexts, like you know, like a, a boy picking lice out of his dog's hair, but he's utterly absorbed in you know his his environment. And that the, 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 real, the realism expressed in such paintings um, exemplifies like attention to reality that is depicted in the subjects themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and he takes there to be a certain kind of moral there and sort of have a kind of benefit I don't know, for viewers. But I, I'm wondering if, if, and I thought of that because when you were talking about um, the sort of transactional character of aesthetic experience, I, I thought right away of um, Hegel's account of genre art, um, but I was wondering if there's any other genres or artists in particular that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, for Dewey, uh, you know, even though he was uh, friends with Albert Barnes for 30 years, and Barnes was way ahead of his time in um, collecting uh, the post-impressionist artists, uh, when Dewey writes about art in artist experience. Um, the pinnacle for him is, you know, Keats and Shakespeare. You know, so he does not push uh, the envelope very much in terms of, uh, of a deep appreciation of contemporary art during his lifetime as a, a vehicle for having these kinds of aesthetic experiences. Um, one of the artists that um, I personally have had, you know, deep, meaningful relationship with. Um, and in a spiritual capacity also is Matisse, even though it's very simplified. Uh, you know, Matisse built this, this chapel uh, in Vence, uh, France, just like about 40 minutes from Nice. Uh, and, and being there and, and seeing, you know, light stream across um, very stark, you know, black and white walls from these stained glass windows and constantly um, creating these, these different aesthetic experiences through this you know, transactional relationship with the environment uh, has, had, has had a big impact on me. So I, I think it's up to the individual to find whatever <coughs> you know, gets them turned on aesthetically. Uh, so I think any work of art really has the capacity to do it. Um, but it's not, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot I don't know still um, about it uh, and, and things that have been written otherwise. Um, but in philosophical counseling, there hasn't been um, much work on, on the relationship of particular artworks um, having a, a deep impact. Um, but to share something else, which I didn't think that I was going to share because I thought it would make me too upset, but now I'm like, ah, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, are you familiar with the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead? Right, yeah. Um, so this is my, my favorite play, uh, and I read it for the first time at 13 and uh, saw the movie, you know, uh, a year later. It's one of my favorite movies ever. Um, I took my boyfriend to see it uh, the last night we ever uh, saw each other. 
So maybe it will make me upset. Um, <laughs> and so I took a man who had a very skewed sense of identity and self, who was, in retrospect, dissolving like an Alka-Seltzer tablet. Uh, you know, tragedy happens when grief and rage are, you know, intermingling. His mother died two weeks before he killed himself, also. Um, and, uh, you know, so there was a lot going on for him. Um, and I took this man to see this play, uh, or to, to see this movie. And I think, um, you know, yeah, it's an adaptation of Hamlet. Certainly that doesn't end well for most players in, in it. Uh, and all, all these existential themes of, of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern not knowing who they are throughout um, the work of art and not understanding what their purpose really is and kind of and being misled, you know. Um, there's a, you know, a sense of poetic justice in Hamlet that they end up, you know, getting killed because they're, you know, <coughs> in cahoots with Claudius, but they don't really necessarily know that they're, you know, traveling back to England with Hamlet to have him killed. Um, but anyway, so that movie ends, um, you know, with this hanging scene. And then I left my partner and he, you know, spent the evening Googling how to, to do that to himself. Um, and that is just crazy. I will get upset. Uh, so that, that work of art is compromised for me, you know, in a very particular way now. I even have the poster for the movie in my childhood bedroom, you know? It, it, it was such a deep, meaningful work of art. And I think, in retrospect, it made sense that I became, uh, that I pursued philosophy as a life path. You know, like you think, oh, you're 13, you get exposed to a play, it has this deep meaning, um, and then really shapes what your life turns out to be. And then to have that uh, all called into question, and this is, you know, to the, the point of asking Oscar, how does one overcome a feeling of unwarranted guilt? <laughs> you know, it's a coincidence that that happened, you know, and obviously not responsible for the instability of a man to then turn around and do that. Um, <laughs> but it does make you think about it, you know, and uh, yeah. So there's that also. <laughs> um, okay, follow up. Next question. <laughs> Jessica. I have an unrelated question back to your paper. Uh -huh. um, okay. So. It's good. Yeah. Diversion. I like that. Thank Welcome. you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, why transactional? Why that word for that experience? Uh, well, um, Philip Jackson uses it, and okay. secondary sources are sweet. So it's not your term? Not so my it's, term. It's, no, there's. It see? seems in. It seems to undermine, like, it seems to undermine the aesthetic experience to call it kind of a transactional situation. Um, also, certainly it's intersubjective in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, there was more of that paper that I banned in, like, Peter Pan. Um, but, uh, so, it, why do you think it, it <coughs> does a disservice in some way? Well, it's bringing, I mean, it's an, it's, an, it's an economic term that seems straight, like, I would think maybe like co-emergent or um, communal, but transactional seems to have this. Um, maybe it's getting at the give and take of the situation, and that makes sense. But it just rang strange to my ears. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that it does uh, speak to the the give and take that uh, a person has on the environment and that environment's gonna act back on the person in some way. Uh, and, and then our relationship to, to objects in the world and the environment's you know, impact on those, um, that that's, that's where it's oh. coming from. Um, but I like that, I'll, I'll examine that more closely if that catches somebody's ear. Also, thank you for shutting down the emotion button in my head. <laughs> yeah. so, um, just another terminological point from the paper. Um, I was just wondering if you could define aesthetic because there seem to be several definitions of aesthetic operative in the paper, some of which seem to maybe contradict themselves. For instance, if we could talk, of, like, if I can just borrow this as a way of <coughs> for, uh, this phrase, if we call it the divided line, 
where you started with um, the anesthetic experience and then moved up to like the fully aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. You said something about the anesthetic experience, like people, you know, are disconnected and don't stop and smell the roses or see like the, the symphony that is like the morning traffic jam, but that also borrows um, ideas that specifically have to do with works of art. And it seems to me that the idea is to get people to find an aesthetic experience that has nothing to do with a work of art. And yet by the time you've worked yourself to the sort of fourth level, it seemed to be so dependent on works of art. And so what's problematic for me is that there are communities that maybe experience trauma that don't have the luxury of experiencing first world art or what we in the West see as like worthy and valuable pieces of art and that you would want to help these people cope with these traumas in a way where they find a deeper aesthetic meaning in life like, you know, what's aesthetic about a traffic jam or a sunset but you seem to set up a system where they need to have a reference to a specific work of art to be able to find that aesthetically valuable. So just, I was just wondering, what, what exactly do you mean by aesthetic? Thanks, uh, I appreciate that. Um, that uh, if that's what came across, I, that was not the intention, um, the, and also not what Dewey is after, because he thinks that there is this separation between everyday life and this great aesthetic phenomena that's around and happening and that we're just not uh, perceptually aware of. So he really doesn't think that you, and, and also Morton and I don't think that you need these great uh, experiences with works of art in order to be able to, uh, to have an aesthetic experience. It's any kind of experience that you can be engaged in if it's got this unifying emotion, if it's unique, if it's rounded out in a complete way, and if you're appreciative, perceiving, and enjoying in a way, right? And if you're, um, uh, this idea between undergoing versus doing, you know, you have to be actively engaged, and there has to be some level of interest that spurs it, which is this idea of impulsion. You can't have an experience unless there's some catalyst, uh, you know, some intriguing catalyst that, like, draws you towards it because otherwise you'll be shut down to the opportunities that are there, you know. Um, so I have to go over it again to make sure uh, that, that, you know, I don't, I don't put that idea across that, that the work of art has to be at the center of it. Yeah, and that, and that might just be my own misunderstanding. And then just to follow up to that, so you were talking about um, sort of part of the way that we don't be experience things aesthetically, you were talking about these sort of like discontinuities, like we have this way of sort of car um, compartmentalizing our experiences, but then you talked about how you have to be able to look at the aesthetic experience and somehow there has to be sort of like a beginning and an end there, and like we can give it a name or whatever, mm -hmm. which implies like a certain um, formalism at play there. So I'm just also curious about that, like it seems that sort of going through our life and saying, well, I wake up in the morning and then I go to work and then I come home and then I do this, you know, like dividing it and separating it so much takes away from the ex from the aesthetic experience of it because it's like we're just going through the steps of a different process of our day. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, like naming the experience and being able to bracket it off in some way from everything else is also a, a apparently like a really um, key aspect to having the aesthetic experience. So I just wondered if you could talk about that too, like how is it that we're able to name the experience of that sunset at that place was kind of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. That all that already implies that you have to be able to work on some sort of discontinuity, right? You have to be able to separate that experience from the rest of it. So yeah. like, I guess, why was that important? Like being able to name a particular experience and give it, you know, sort of bookends as that particular experience. Yeah. Um, thank you for listening, because that was, you know, <laughs> well paraphrased in some way. Uh, it's one of these aspects that, it, you know, things are always happening, right? Experience is happening continually as the live creature meets an environing condition. And I think about this in my own life because I'm, I think I'm aesthetically engaged with the world that um, I can identify, like, oh, this is an aesthetic experience um, as I'm in it, but it still has already happened at that point. So there's still a level of naming it that occurs. And while that sunset or that flower or the smell of that, you know, pot of coffee is brewing 
that you know really piques my interest and I'm like oh aesthetic experience um, I might I will probably forget those later and then as we Rolodex in our mind you know these pictures of what makes up the meaning and value of our life and also the very deep um, problematic tensions in our life uh, those you can those you can name quite effectively you know and so those end up being the really um, significant aesthetic experiences in life. And, and I should say I agree because I have like one particular sunset that I'll always remember and for me it's like that sunset me and the couple people that were there mm -hmm. and I don't know maybe for some reason it makes me appreciate sunsets and or sunrises or whatever that much more because I have that one paradigmatic like sunset that I remember you know what I mean yeah. and so now if I see like a really pretty sunset I'll be like, oh, that's a great sunset. Man, I remember that one, you know? And, and maybe that's part of it, too. I mean, I like that idea that you need to be able to name that experience because otherwise it would all just come out in the wash, right? I mean, there has to be something heightened about that experience that makes it worth remembering as that particular moment of this ideal aesthetic experience or something is how I'm understanding it. Yeah. But I guess I was just thinking more in terms of the, you know, how does that name sort of say, okay, now that we can name that, that is the experience, but yeah, why shouldn't every sunset? Man, I'm just talking to myself. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> Part of um, like the context behind the writing of this book is, you know, so Dewey was the director of education at the Barnes Foundation. The Barnes educational experiment began in Albert Barnes' factory, where he had mostly African American employees. Um, you know. Uh, bottling uh, his um, pharmaceutical eye drop that he had in, uh, invented with a German colleague and made millions of dollars off of. And Barnes wanted to bring to African Americans who didn't have an opportunity otherwise to study it. And then it was abstracted from just African Americans to um, anyone who was not initiated into formal education and people who were factory workers. Uh, and he started the school that is the Barnes Foundation uh, and the point was to find a way to empower and broaden the horizons of people who felt that you know, engagement with the arts was just a luxury and um, to show that the daily doings and sufferings of the human condition have an aesthetic component to them. So the point is to lift up and cultivate um, you know, people who wouldn't think that they had a right or an opportunity to engage in this kind of activity because it should just be for leisure. And that then speaks to this Maslowian hierarchy that Morton Fostwald and I want to see kind of thrown out to put um, uh, aesthetic, you know, uh, aesthetic appreciation much lower down the ladder so that we all can engage in life that way. Um, I'm going to get upset again because, like, uh, my partner, you know, if he if he was not somebody aesthetically inclined at all, you know, and if he was, and if for as much as I talked his ear off about this stuff, um, and you know, he's read that paper and I read that paper to him, uh, so if that man could have, you know, been able to step outside himself and and uh, be a bit more authentically engaged in um, this transactional relationship uh, with um, with aesthetic phenomena then you know might have wanted to see another sunset you know or have another cup of Wawa coffee you know or something like that so I think there's great value in in, in, um, in training our minds uh, to be more acutely aware of moments around us, you know. And this is also something that, you know, like I don't just see the good in the world at a much more heightened level. I'm also a much more se uh, acutely sensitive perceiver of um, homeless people and uh, litter and, um, you know, squalor and, uh, and I'm, you know, uh, one of the things that Donovan got a master's in philosophy, I focused on um, applied ethics at Westchester and uh, human rights is, is a big issue for me, and I'm involved in a lot of anti-human trafficking initiatives, you know. 
and so I'm always very acutely aware of, oh, this girl here working at this nail salon, it's, you know, I wonder what her life is like, and I engage people in dialogue, you know, in a kind of intimate way to make sure people are okay, you know, kids that are alone somewhere. Um, and I think if there's a, even though in the paper there is um, a, a, a split, um, it was an, a line we argued over, uh, my colleague um, wanted to show the distinction between impulsion and Dewey and intentionality and phenomenology, but I actually think Dewey and Husserl um, create a nice bridge to one another because you have the reconstruction of thought in uh, Dewey's philosophy and you have the epoche of one's doxology in Husserl, the bracketing, um, which is, you know, you talked about that bracketing out of experience. I, I think there is a correlation there. And in um, our intersubjective engagement with the world that comes out of Dewey's, uh, excuse me, come, uh, comes out of Husserl's work, there are the ethical ramifications of um, you should engage in the environment differently and engage with people differently when you're able to, you know, um, bracket uh, out different aspects of life to, uh, the, the epoche is, is, is a reconstruction of thought, uh, in my opinion. Rambling. Anybody else? Hi. Hi, I'm Tet. Um, I'm a grad student in the English department. Um, and um, I'm interested, um, I guess, to ask two slightly connected things. One is, um, am I perceiving correctly that you're in some ways interested in this yourself as a practitioner departing from Oscar's style um, or not? And secondly, um, um, as I'm listening to you, as somebody very sympathetic with the anti-psychiatry movement, movement, but who's also a patient, so I'm, I've got my foot in two different camps, um, I'm kind of, um, I'm noticing, even as I, as I imagine just kind of this, and I'm thinking about all the challenges that must take place in the US to kind of um, something which might kind of contravene a lot of the anxiety, say, in the DSM, in the psychiatric system. I'm also wondering, maybe as you bring up, like about different multicultural contexts for counseling, and then I'm like, well, how do you even think about how to apply a new paradigm for counseling without referring back to the dominant institutions? And I'm wondering how you navigate all that stuff. I yes. Guess. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, um, as Oscar would say, how I navigate it. Um, well, my complacency, you know, helps me avoid navigating through it. Uh, but I'm working on that. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I do, I am a subscriber to Oscar's method. I think that it is, as much as I've trained in it, I find it to lack a level of teachability because Oscar has a tremendous gift. Uh, and also this incredible sense of humor, uh, which sugars the pill uh, for people. And I don't, you can't teach that, you know. Um, People can be self-deprecating or what have you, but he just, um, he has this ability to do it. And so the focus on, on logic and critical thinking and sharpening one's own uh, skill set in that helps people make these interventions uh, in a counseling session. But I would say that I'm much better suited to be a conversational type philosophical counselor and bring, you know, bring art into it um, as, a, you know, bring this, uh, this aesthetic aspect into it as a way to, I think it's a gift that can be given to people. I think people can learn to appreciate aesthetic aspects of life much more significantly. Uh, and then there's the, the very practical side of it. I would like to make a living. You know, so what do you do? You can't just keep studying somebody's method. You have to develop your own curriculum and your own workshops and find some remote tropical place to stick people for a week so they'll pay you to come <laughs> and learn your method. And, um, you know, there's an aspect of that to it, right? Donovan and I started our own little philosophy business years ago, which is working out great. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, the Society for Philosophical Research and Practice. Uh, and so, you know, um, I think that that's, that's part of it is to, de to develop your own, to go out on your own and, and to, to own it in a way, to contribute in a way, um, not just um, 
study with Ockenbach or study with Oscar or study with Lou Marinoff and then think, well, okay, I can have my own little practice now and everybody wants a shingle with their name on it. And, um, that answer your question? I think it answers both questions, okay. actually. Um, yeah, I understand. Maybe one more. Yeah, maybe, well, maybe we can just take the last the two here. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you don't need to answer this now because I can email you to find out other resource material. And you've mentioned uh, a couple of resources, the C.S. Lewis. Um, aside from Dewey, who I think is rather narrow, who I love, but mm -hmm. I think is rather narrow in his um, interpretation or definition of aesthetic experience. So I'm interested in that. But my comment really is, in a way, um, there's. Oscar's approach, which is um, very direct and penetrating, and and, um, and then there's sailing. And so uh, I'm a theater professor, so I create these events which are more like sailing. And by that I mean indirect, where you don't know exactly where you're going. The person sailing knows they're going from New York to Bermuda. But if you're on that boat and they're not explaining why they're going in a zigzag manner, in response to these outside forces, then you really are um, can't explain uh, the path of the journey, and and in a sense you're in the realm of mystery, right? And you have to experience without knowing what it is exactly your experience or how you're getting there. So through that you can have transcendence or self-actualization or Oscar's method, which is um, you know obviously different. Approach, different path to I think the same the same end uh, a confrontation more of a confrontational path so it, they both have their obviously their strengths um, the the latter the sailing is more of a metaphor for what I do but in a sense when you said mystery I think you're alluding to sometimes the indirect way is the only culpable way of dealing with events sometimes the direct way is intolerable in the same way that sometimes the direct way to experience an aesthetic experience is intolerable. You can't tolerate a direct experience. You have to go on a journey, which you don't see as an aesthetic experience, right, until you arrive at an end that was unforeseen. So, so it, it, in other words, I don't think you can make something, you can't tolerate beauty, tolerate beauty in a direct way. So that's a statement. But what do you think of that analogy between those two different paths? Uh, I'm touched and I'm thankful you're in the room <laughs> and uh, appreciative of that comment and I think that it, um, it, it I think it was beautiful and, and describes a little without, without me recognizing that it's what I'm going through at the moment I think I'm experiencing that right it's, it's part of this has been intolerable for me in the la m most of the last, ex last month has been quite intolerable dealing um, with these cold facts about my new reality. And I was not, I have not been able to directly confront a lot of it uh, because of intolerable aspects of it. I didn't, I didn't in my own head associate, you know, my nautical sailing metaphor, um, but maybe that's part of how uh, I engage with life. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. Um, Oscar, the conf confrontational aspect of that was significant. If anyone would like, I can send you the video if you want to watch the whole thing, and then I had to do an analysis of it, and that's like seven pages. Um, that I've written and, and sent back to him uh, because he beats up on me more and more as we go through it. Um, which is, it was therapeutic, that was very therapeutic to, uh, people don't want to deal with uh, criticism or negative aspects of themselves. Um, you know, at the very end, he talked about making things more palatable. And so I evade um, to try to make a situation more palatable. I use a lot of language. Uh, to make situations better for myself and allow me to cope with uh, unpleasant aspects of reality. Oscar calls it drowning the fish. And that's why he, you know, you attempt to drown the fish with language and instead of um, engaging in this purely conceptual uh, game uh, where you have to be held responsible for words that you're using to, to name 
uh, yourself or criticize your behavior. Um, and that's, that's difficult for anybody. So one of the things that Oscar talks about, and he mentions it in, the, um, uh, in, in our talk, I, I appreciated that he, there was a, there's a lot of meta, you know, uh, meta method in, um, in this, uh, this con consultation session. Um, but one of the main aspects of, of trying to be a philosophical counselor is engaging in the work yourself and in put, putting in the work as a client in order to um, you know, move forward. Sorry, that was long, but did yeah, you let's get Dan's last. Uh, uh, you started answering. I was just going to ask you more about Oscar because, um, yeah, it was a very confrontational style. Like, I've heard about philosophical counseling and why, you know, it's different than psychiatry or psychology. So I just talk about your parents and, you know, ethical conflicts or whatever. But you, when you, I liked your paper because that conformed in some way more to my image of what it might be an aesthetic experience in using Dewey. But Oscar did not <laughs> at all. And it seemed like a very different kind of, um, Strategy. So he started explaining it a bit more. So I was just asking how, like, what, what in his method constitutes sort of philosophical counseling, or what makes it philosophical. He started out by saying, "Oh, it's coming out of my book on Zen," mm. and that made a certain amount of sense because it's like the Zen master, you know, is confronting you with kind of impossible things. Put your hand up and start clapping, or Zen koans, which don't really make sense, but they're confrontational. He seemed to be adopting that to some degree as a kind of philosophical. Uh, counseling method, but um, yeah, I mean, the clips were really interesting and it yeah. just made me think like, what exactly is, how, why is what he is doing philosophical counseling? I mean, maybe, or maybe just his strategy. Mm. So you started answering that. Yeah, now. there, and um, again, uh, I can point out, um, uh, if I could just show one more little, then we can all leave and go eat dinner. But there's my favorite moment of uh, the session, I'm knocking over the water. Oh, in 1922 or 1922. Uh, maybe, uh, um, maybe one. So harsh. He doesn't, you know, he, I want to show you two moments where he curses. Um, obviously, the earlier one where he's telling me that, like, I feel shitty. And, this um, and so he, of course, you know, it's that, you know, he doesn't use many curse words throughout the whole video, but they're for a particular purpose. Um, but yeah, Morton Foswell, I can send you his, his papers on Oscar. I think he's done the best work to describe what the method is um, and, and naming um, these steps that happen in Oscar's work. Um. You're familiar with this kind of pattern in yourself. Yes. Yes. And then you're taken over by all kind of ghosts that you're stuck with. Correct. Right. You can call that ghost on the warranted guilt, but I'm sure there's a whole uh, collection, the whole family's there, you know, of all kind of things uh, inhabiting your brain. Yes, no? Yes. Yes, and they're, they're tiresome, all these, uh, this whole bunch of, uh, of ghosts. Mm -hmm. Yes, no? Yes. But why you let them live in your fucking house? <laughs> what? Why do that? I don't know. It's the it just happens. You get grow used to these things, you know. You grow used to these things, right? Sure. You're so used to these things that they make your life miserable. Does that make sense? Huh? It doesn't. But that's how people live. Well, then about people. If you want to use people as a criteria, then you know as well. You know, rape, kill, torture. You know, uh, you, I, I didn't know that this uh, average American or a human being was the criteria you set for yourself. I didn't know, is that a new thing you have that, you know? No, you know, an excuse. You, yeah, but you see how you use all these cheap arguments? Did you see this? Yes. Right, that's what I mean. Uh, you know, the impression I have someone come out that never thought, if I didn't know you, I said, wow, this woman never thinks, you know? Mm -hmm. It's amazing, no? Yeah. Yeah. And when and you see yourself doing this, like this brainless stuff, yes, yes, uh, not just today, right? All the moments you see yourself doing, it. yes, yes, it's not possible otherwise. There's, you know, consciousness is there, and when you see yourself doing this, well, what do you do? What's your reaction? Your I. Feel instead of think. 
And, and what do you feel? Joy? No. No. What do you feel at that moment? I feel sadness and anger and hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and well, well, well. No. Good. You, you see? It? Why do you keep doing it? Yeah. You know? Um. So, laughing at my pain. Um, <laughs> Right, so uh, I just wanted to, to, that's a nice moment to end on. <laughs> um, he is a, a significant philosopher in his own way, I think. He's, he's made a, a tremendous contribution to philosophical counseling and to philosophy for children. In the same way he was talking to me, except for the, the curse words, he talks to children. And you can watch tons of videos of him on, on YouTube. He makes all kinds of people cry. Um, Donovan and I have seen people, grown men, philosophers, storm out of rooms. Uh, and a lot of people accuse him of being uh, misogynistic. And uh, because, you know, uh, I see men get very angry and leave, and women sometimes cry. But I've also seen women storm out of rooms, you know, um, and take a lot of great offense to what he's saying. But he reveals, he helps you, he, he will not solve anyone's problem. And that's, uh, that's a part of philosophical counseling that's sort of at the core. We make no claims to solve your problems, but we'll raise consciousness uh, in you about how you're, how you're behaving in your life. And that is, um, that's very different, I think, because philosophers are upfront about that, you know. Um, and we do it without pharmaceuticals, you know, um, which I think is a good thing. Thank you all so much yeah. for your attention.